Hello everyone, thank you all for joining today. My name is Noemi Razo and I'm the Technical Support Engineer at Millar. We're very excited to introduce today's webinar titled Pressure Volume Loops and Half Path Evaluation. A bit of housekeeping before we begin, all audio from the attendees will be muted during the presentation. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the webinar where I will welcome Dr. Jan Schroeder, Medical Advisor at CDLACOM, to participate in the discussion. Feel free to send us your questions as the webinar progresses. You can do that by typing your questions in the questions panel on the GoToWebinar toolbar. You may need to expand the questions panel by selecting the plus sign. We received feedback during our last PV loop webinar requesting a review of the three load independent PV loop contractile state indices. Today's webinar will take a deeper dive at discussing the end systolic pressure volume relationship, ESPVR, the Starling contractile index, and the preload recruitable stroke work. There are several reported methods for calculating or determining the ESPVR line. We will discuss three methods today. To support our discussion of calculating ESPVR from load changes, we will discuss several clinical methods to vary load conditions. The webinar will then conclude with a review of clinical, a clinical publication highlighting the value of PV loops and half-path evaluation. The slope of the systolic pressure volume relationship ESPVR provides insight into the ventricles and systolic elastins, which provides an index of ventricular myocardial contractility. The ESPVR line is generated by plotting a line through the end systolic points of the PV loop. The slope of the ESPVR line gives us a measure of contractility. A steeper or greater slope would indicate higher ventricular contractility. There are several methods used to calculate the ESPVR line. For now, we will discuss the ESPVR with varying load changes. These load changes can be induced by either increases or decreases in volume load. In this example, preload is reduced by occluding the inferior vena cava with a balloon catheter. Vena cava occlusion decreases venous return to the heart, thereby causing a progressive fall in end diastolic volume or preload over several beats. As preload progressively decreases, the PV loop moves to the left and gets smaller. A line can then be drawn through the upper left corner of each loop as shown in the conduct and T view. The line represents the ESPVR and both the slope and the x-intercept can be determined. The decrease in volume pressure is also evident in the total volume and pressure waveforms. The calculated lines view in conductant T provide a visual of the preload recruitable stroke work in Starling contractile index. Load independent indices can be estimated without load changes from a single beat and monitor continuously. When performing load changes is not possible, the ESPVR line can be plotted by connecting the end systolic points with X and Y intercept at zero, as seen on the green line inter intercepting zero and end systolic point. The ESPVR line can also be plotted by determining the max pressure point. The max pressure point is determined by plotting steepness of the increase in pressure during the isovolumetric contraction phase. The ESPVR is then plotted from the max pressure and end systolic volume. It is important to note that this method of ESPVR is not suitable when the patient has mitral regurgitation. The pressure increase of the left ventricle will be offloaded. The Starling contractile index tells us the ability of the heart to change its force of contraction and therefore the stroke volume in response to venous return. It can be derived by dividing max DPDT 
by end-diastolic volume. The preload recruitable stroke work can be derived by dividing stroke work by end-diastolic volume and gives us the contractile state of the entire cardiac cycle. Let's discuss the acute effects of the intraaortic balloon pump on left ventricular function. On the top, we see the aortic pressure waveform. It is then followed by the start of the aortic balloon pumping. The intraaortic balloon pumping induces prolonged ejection of beat 1 and further beats. The decrease in afterload makes the end systolic elastins visible and then lowers the contractile state or the end systolic elastins, which then increases the stroke volume. In this example, we compare the loading effects after the mitral clip procedure. The yellow PV loop is representative of baseline, and the green PV loop is post mitral clip. In the post PV loop, we see an immediate decrease in the offloading of the mitral regurgitation, and therefore, we see a shift of the loops to the right according to the ensystolic elastins line. There are several methods used to alter volume load in the ventricle. We will discuss several of these techniques and their load effect. Traditionally, literature cites the use of the balloon catheter to occlude the inferior vena cava. IVC occlusion will reduce the preload volume in the ventricle. A PV loop shift to the left will be evident as well as volume and pressure decrease. Non-invasive methods of altering load include the Vasalva maneuver, bicycle, and hand grip exercise. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, also known as HEFPEF, is common in aged individuals with systolic hypertension and is frequently attributed to diastolic dysfunction. The clinical publication we will review today discusses systolic and arterial stiffening in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. The data supports evidence that HEFPEF patients also display combined ventricular systolic and arterial stiffening that can exacerbate blood pressure liability and diastolic dysfunction under stress induced by hand grip exercises. It is critical to introduce exercise and half path evaluation. In the plus shown, the dashed lines is representative of PV relations before hand grip, and the dark solid line is after sustained hand grips. Each graph is representative of different half path patients. It is noticeable in each half path patient that there is an increase in end diastolic pressure, indicating arterial stiffening, and the stroke volume is decreased. Baseline loops also display an elevated end systolic elastins. So that concludes the pressure volume loops and half path evaluation presentation. Now we will proceed with the questions and answer portion with Dr. Jan Schroeder joining us.